Ajith Fernando. Ajith Fernando serves as Teaching Director of Youth for Christ in Sri Lanka after being National Director for 35 years. His grassroots ministry has been and is primarily with the urban poor. Ajith has a wider counseling and mentoring ministry with Christian leaders and workers and a teaching ministry in conferences and theological schools in Sri Lanka and abroad. He is also an award-winning author of 16 books and several booklets and articles which have been published in 20 different languages. Let's welcome Ajith Fernando. I can't tell you what a joy and a privilege it is for me to be here. Uh, I was so shocked when I got this invitation to speak here. Uh, I have been praying for the Arab Christians, especially for the Palestinian Christians, for many years. Especially after I read that they feel abandoned by the rest of the world and uh, the, the Christian world. And so it is such a privilege for me to be able to speak here. Let me say that I'm not an expert on the Palestinian-Israeli uh, issue. And um, I wonder what can I say that will be of some help to the people here. Um, I thought that out of our experience of living in a country that has been wracked by war and also by severe persecution on Christians, there is something, we've had a war for about 30 years and the war finished a few years ago. Maybe there is something that, there is, that we experienced and learned from the scriptures that might be of help to the people here. Uh, I have, for the last so many years, been trying to help Christians to um, apply the centrality of Christ in Sri Lanka, in a country uh, that was wracked by war, and hatred, uh, and, um, and I think uh, what we learned can be of some use to the people here too. Surely the church is one of God's key uh, weapons, uh, instruments, in bringing a solution to the problems of this area, and the church can contribute towards that. Uh, let me say that the titles in your uh, in, the, uh, in the timetable uh, are a little different to what I'm going to share with you because I prepared my talk after I sent the titles. And you know what happens when you start preparing. Things change. So, so it's a little different. Um, but um, uh, let me just start with a small introduction to Christ as being the center point and climax of history and then go to one aspect of participating with Christ's mission, which is sharing in his sufferings. Um, Christ, of course, is the clue to understanding human history. His work is the center point of history. His triumph is the climax, is going to be the climax of history. The preaching of his gospel determines the end, the, the, the end of history. For example, Matthew 24, 14 says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the ends of the earth, and then the end will come. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 24 to 25, it says that the end is going to come after Jesus rules till he has put all his enemies under his feet, and he has destroyed every rule and authority and power. And so we look for the day that Revelation 11, 15 talks about. When one day the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now this shapes our attitude to life and service. We are participating in God's program. Our actions contribute to the building of the kingdom so in Romans 18, 8, 17, that's the passage I'm going to look at, Romans 8. Um, in Romans 8, 17, he says that we are fellow heirs with Christ um, so that uh, we can, um, uh, 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 that we are fellow heirs with Christ. We'll talk about the rest later. Um, and we, so we are called to carry forward the mission of Christ. So Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I have sent you. So there are different aspects of the 
uh, of our participation in the program of Christ. And I want to talk about one of those aspects, which I think is very important and needs to be emphasized in the church today. And that is suffering. We participate with Christ's suffering. So, uh, uh, chapter 8, Romans 8, 17. The first part said that we are fellow heirs with Christ. And then the second part says, provided we suffer with him, in order that we might be glorified with him. That's part of the aspect of the path to glorification, suffering with Christ. Many years ago, I did a study of every place in the New Testament where Jesus is given as an example for us to follow. I found 29 examples. I may have missed a few, but I found 29. Four of them were general statements. Um, uh, follow me as I follow Christ and things like that. Four of them spoke about the meekness, the gentleness, and the forgiveness of Christ. Six of them spoke about Jesus as servant. Two of them as suffering servant. Fifteen others were about following Jesus in suffering. And then you take the two suffering servant ones, and you end up with 17 out of 29. And if you put the servant, all the servant ones, the suffering and the servant brings up 21 out of 29 passages. So when we think of following Christ, one of the key features of following Christ is suffering. He was a suffering servant, and we are called to be suffering servants in this world. So verse 17 says, if we are fellow heirs, if we suffer with him. Of course, this is an aspect of our communion with Christ. Philippians 3.10, Paul desires to be one with Christ. To be, he wants, the, he desires the fellowship of sharing in Christ's suffering. But Paul, of course, found this out right at his conversion. When Jesus spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Paul was shocked to realize that he was hitting the church and Jesus was feeling the pain. The church and Jesus had become one in suffering. So, uh, so these are two aspects of the Christian value system. We suffer with him and we will be glorified with him. Both need to be considered together. Verse 18 says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the suffering, uh, with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This suffering is not even worth comparing with the glory ahead of us. So every day, as Christians, we think of the cross and we think of the consummation. We participate in the cross so that we can participate in the consummation. We won't be disillusioned then when suffering comes our way on earth. The wheat and the weeds grow together. The two kingdoms grow side by side. One is visible, one is not visible. Christ's kingdom will finally win and we are contributing to its progress. So we don't isolate ourselves from the world and hide we get involved in life here in society, in our society, and are not deterred by the price that comes from doing so. Verse 19 tells us that the consummation includes the revealing of God's children. It says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. This is a new way to describe the consummation. The, creati the creation is waiting for a revelation. And what is that revelation? The revealing of the children of God. We are key, key players in the cosmic drama. This is one of the way, many ways to describe the future honor that comes to us. We may have present shame we may be despised as insignificant people, but a future honor 
awaits us. We are small people with a big vision. We serve the King of Kings. So we persevere. In one of the Christ as example passages, Romans 12, 1 and 2, we are told to look at Jesus. And very often we stop there, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. But it goes on to say what we see when we look at Jesus. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Uh, he despised the shame. We also despise the shame that we encounter. We look at honor and shame from the perspective of the kingdom agenda. This is not a res resignation to an unjust system, saying that one day we are going to have glory on earth. Rather, it is a refusal to be defeated by the unjust system. Refusal to be paralyzed by shame. We despise the shame and follow Christ as his servants in our world. If we allow the feeling of being despised to overtake us, we will become bitter, defeated people. So we despise the shame. We are proactive in our obedience. We don't just endure shame, we despise it. We embrace the suffering because that is involved in serving our servant Lord. The, pros the prospect of glory takes away the sin sting of shame. Uh, then we are, talked, we, we are told about how creation is subjected to frustration, to futility. Um, verse 20 says, uh, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Probably we are talking here about the fall, and with the fall came frustration, futility to this world. Things don't work, go on as we wish for them to go. We are misunderstood and persecuted. We are misrepresented. In Sri Lanka during the war, anyone who spoke up for the rights of the minority was called a terrorist. And we love our nation. It was difficult to be called a terrorist. But that goes, we are misrepresented. That's part of the frustration of living in this world. We suffer physical and emotional pain and sickness. Our plans are buckled by unavoidable circumstances. I will never forget a major rally. We got a peace rally after a huge riot in our country. We got permission to do a peace rally in a highly populated place where people come on Sunday evenings. And it was one of those great opportunities. So we prepared, we worked so hard for it. And it was in the open air. It didn't rain before the rally for many days. Didn't rain after the rally for many days. On the day of the rally, it just rained. We had worked so hard. I think I was suffering from depression for about two weeks after that. But that's part of the frustration of living in a fallen world. The pain of death is fully removed only at the resurrection. Until then, we suffer when we die, and others suffer because we die. God is a miracle-working God, but his way to save the world is through incarnation. First the incarnation of Christ, and then the incarnation of Christians. Yet. It was in hope that the world was subjected to frustration. The world, Paul says, is going to be set free from the corrupt bondage of corruption which causes this frustration. So again in verse 21, it talks about the hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So, Two things are going to happen. Creation is going to be redeemed, and there's glory for the children of God. All this is a motivation for obedience. I'm saying this because, uh, you know, when things get really bad, you just want to go home and cry. It's very, we will see later that crying is a very, very noble 
action. But we cry and we work because we believe that God is still working. And so, um, uh, all, uh, you know, this is the wisest investment we can make while we are on earth. Jim Elliott, who was one of the five missionaries who was martyred in Ecuador, and then his wife went and did a great work among the people who martyred his, uh, her husband. Uh, Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Talks about the creation groaning. Uh, it's in the pains of childbirth. So again, the aspect of hope is here. The groaning is going to be proceeded, uh, ended with the childbirth, with the glory of childbirth. Uh, but verse 23 tells us something more. It says, not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. We have experienced the first fruits of the Spirit. That's what gives us the strength to groan. Uh, we will talk a lot about groaning uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But before that, we need to have the first fruits of the Spirit. This is what gives us strength to take on pain. You need strength for the Christian type of groaning. We are not afraid of it because we have the Spirit with us, the first fruits. We have tasted heaven. So John 15, 11 says, I have told you these things that my joy may be in you and your joy will be full. After talking about joy, he says, love one another as I have loved you. And then he says, greater love is no one than this, that a man should give his life for his friend. So first, the joy, and then the sacrificial service. I heard a missionary called David Sitton talk about how when he was a young person, there was a 90-year-old missionary who came to the youth fellowship. And he was, um, uh, he was uh, uh, speaking. Uh, he had been a missionary for 73 years. He had gone at 17. And when he got up to speak, uh, he just kept saying the same thing over and over and over again. I'm going to say you, uh, I'm going to tell you something don't forget it. It's the most important thing I could tell you. And he just kept saying this over and over and over again. And the young people were sort of wanting to prompt him, say, say what you wanted to say. And he finally said it. He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When the joy leaves, the strength goes. And then he went and sat down. So we have to maintain the joy of the Lord. Disciplines to maintain the joy of the Lord, which enables us to go into a hurting, bruised world and to groan with this world. So we groan. We who have the first fruits groan. Uh, the Old Testament, of course, has a form in which the groaning takes place, and that's the lament. Depending on who you're following, uh, of the 150 Psalms, 50 to 75 are laments where the people grapple with God, argue with God, express their pain. Hurt is real. Injustice violates God's ways. We rise up in protest when we see it. Even Christ groaned. He wept at the funeral in Mark 8, 12, when the Pharisees tested him, asking for a sign. We are told he sighed deeply in his spirit. In the garden, you find him in deep agony. At the cross, he cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, this is another aspect of our union with Christ. When we groan for what we suffer, we are like Jesus. You know, I'm a little worried about the sanitized Christian funerals 
that we have in the Protestant tradition. Um, I think it's a no lament. Biblical, in the Bible, there's a high place for lament. Um, and there is elaborate mourning uh, in, in the Bible when somebody dies. Uh, and Buddhists in Sri Lanka think we dishonor our dead by the way we have our funerals. Christians are not afraid of sorrow. We are uh, and of righteous anger. So we can groan. But we groan to God who knows our pain. And that's what takes away bitterness and that's what gives us comfort. I was in Northern Ireland about seven years ago when my wife called me just before I was going to speak at a meeting. And she told me the results of some tests that we thought were very, un very inconsequential. But it turned out that she was having cancer. And I was alone in Northern Ireland, and uh, I was devastated. I preached 15 minutes after I got the news, I had to preach, but I was free that evening, went to the beach, studied, uh, meditated on Psalm 46, came to my room, and I went to bed, and I began to cry. And as I was weeping, suddenly the thought came to me, I'm weeping to God. And crying to God. And that is the thing that kept us through this ordeal. My wife is here with me now, uh, here, and she, God healed her. We, we are so grateful for that. Uh, but, but all through that time, we would say, Where would we be if Jesus wasn't with us? Where would we be? So, the interesting thing in verse 26, we are told that the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So not only do we groan, the Spirit is so in touch with us that when we, that verse talks about weakness, not knowing how to pray, that when we groan in our weakness, the Spirit comes so close to us that He also groans with us. So groaning is something honorable. And even God does it. How important to remember this in a world that has been so influenced by the importance of appearance and always having to look good in front of people. We open ourselves to God and he comforts us in the process. So this is a key Christian idea. Don't feel bad about feeling bad. <laughs> That's who a Christian is. Paul Tonier wrote a beautiful book after the death of his wife. Paul Tonier is considered the father of modern Christian counseling. Uh, he, it was called, the book was written after his wife died. It was called Creative Suffering. And in that book, he talks about how his parents died, mother when he was a little child, a father, I think, when he was a teenager. And now his wife of many years has died. And he says, the human constitution is constitutionally contradictory. We do unexpected things. And then he says, I can honestly say that I live with a great grief and I am a happy man. I live with a great grief and I am a happy man. Maturity is being able to combine joy with a broken heart. Toyohiko Kagawa, great Christian social reformer and evangelist in, in Japan, once thought he was going blind. He didn't go blind, but he thought he was going blind. And he wrote this when he found this out. The darkness the darkness, in the darkness, I meet God face to face. So we look at suffering as an opportunity to experience more of God. How much depth of experience of God people forfeit when they avoid suffering. You know, some of my friends, especially my friends in the West, 
when they know that I'm going through a bit of a difficult time, uh, suffering from stress and strain, uh, they interpret it as being the stress that comes from drivenness and from competitiveness. Paul talks about another stress that comes from being close to people who are suffering. And, uh, and, um, and very often they write to me saying, this is wrong, you can't live like this, this is wrong, so you're doing something wrong. And I just want to uh, ask you to be careful of such people because they can, they can take us away from the path of obedience and we can miss God's best for us. Now, groaning is an alternative to quitting. If you haven't brought in a theology of suffering into your life, when it comes, you think something is wrong and you say, no, this is not where God wants me to do, be, and you leave. Uh, we, 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 we have permission in the Bible to express our pain. We don't see pain as a mistake. We see pain as part of life. Some say this is wrong and quit. We, and they leave hard places and they give up the battle. Many of my friends have told me, we had a terrible time in 1989. Uh, when we had a terrible revolution in addition to the war. Children didn't go to school for six months and, and there were all sorts of job offers that were coming uh, my way and uh, abroad. And um, they told me, you know, you have sacrificed a lot to, to stay in Sri Lanka. I don't think I, would have, I have sacrificed anything because the happiest place to be is where God's will is. That's the happiest place. And I think when we serve God in the difficulties, in the hardships, if we know that there is meaning here, then we can give up, go, go on without giving up. The problems, the frustration, the pain, the groaning goes with the call. We embrace it, looking forward in hope, believing that it is mean, meaningful. Let me also say that groaning is different to grumbling. Groaning is the cry of the obedient. Grumbling is the cry of the disobedient. People who don't want to accept their leader, for example, are always grumbling about the leader. Um, or, or, or who re reject the tough road ahead. They will grumble. Now finally, let me say, Verses 24 and 25 focuses in on this aspect of hope. It says, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For no one hopes, for, for who hopes for what he sees. Uh, he's saying that hope is a basic feature of the Christian gospel. In this hope we were saved. Faith is trusting God. Hope is trusting God in the dark, when you cannot see ahead. And we are, ours is a religion of hope. You know, during our years of war in Sri Lanka, we always kept our youth clubs open. And in these youth clubs, education was going, the schools were closed, but we continued our education to, to, to poor children. We had sports, people knew that as long, uh, that all day, except at night, people could play, come and play in our, in our facilities. And at night, they would stay and study. Uh, we would provide opportunities for them to study in the, in the office. And so, um, during the war, we wanted to give people this sense. Uh, one of our things was, our centers are places of hope. We haven't given up on Sri Lanka. So, keep your gardens nicely. Keep the place as if we are living in a beautiful place. There is hope in Christianity. Verse 28 talks about this. In all, in all things, God works for the good. And verse 25 talks about a key consequence of hope. It says, but if we hope in what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. You know, I've been amazed at how important patience is to the Christian 
life. There are two basic word groups that talk about patience. One is hupomone, which is sometimes translated as endurance, and the other one is long-suffering, which is uh, uh, metrothumia, which is sometimes translated as long-suffering uh, or patience. Um, these two word groups, um, when you take them, the verb and the noun, and see how many times it's applied to believers, 61 times. The New Testament tells believers to be patient. Obviously, it's a key concept of the Christian life. It is a word that is used in the battlefield of persevering in battle. This is not just dumb resignation. What to do? This is the will of God. No. It is, it is a belief that says that God is working through this for good. And I'm going to participate with God in bringing out this good that he has for us. I looked at five uh, areas of, uh, of, uh, of hope. Five ways in which hope expresses itself. Firstly, obedience without breaking principles. We don't lie and steal to get out of a tough situation. We refuse to take revenge in our cultures. Not taking revenge is to bring dishonor to your family. But we refuse to disobey. We refuse to achieve, to use violence to achieve our ends. Secondly, praying without giving, giving up. You know, there are so many setbacks uh, as we go through life. During the war, I remember once we were having a prayer meeting uh, and praying for the country. And one of our members, a Buddhist convert, said, why are we praying? Nothing is happening. Just God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers. But we don't give up. We keep going. There's a word in the uh, a Greek word, proskartereo, uh, with, which, which is used many times in connection with prayer. The word means to devote oneself to, to persevere. We don't give up. We persevere in prayer. Then, thirdly, refusal, refusing to panic and lash out. When problems come, the presence of God gives us the security not to lash out in the midst of a problem. Then fourthly, working hard amidst the obstacles. We, do, we, uh, we, we don't just give up the job and go away that God has given us to do. We must complete it. We won't give up saying it was too difficult. Uh, I, don't, I couldn't find the time or I have a, a headache. No, we continue. And, and lastly, refusing to give up on the world and to retreat. When we agitate for justice, when we go into political structures and try to change those structures, we are going to be criticized. Christians have a hobby of criticizing Christians in public life. And so we are going to be criticized by the people, very people we want to support us. We look like failures because we seem to be achieving so little. And we wonder, what impact are we having? People say, what impact is he having? He has gone in and what, see what he has done. Well, what has he done? But the Christian says, God put me here. He's working. I won't give up. However small and insignificant we look, we are always the light and the salt of this world. And we go with that ambition. William Wilberforce had to fight over 25 years before he won the battle to liberate British Empire from slavery. But he was working with, with structures that had some Christian, at least nominal Christian thing. Many of us have to work with structures that have no Christian convictions at all. And it will be even tougher. But God still rules the world. And we are his ambassadors. We won't give up. Jesus is Lord. He is working. Our work contributes to his work. We'll suffer. We'll have setbacks. It'll be frustrating. But we won't give up. Because Christianity is a religion of hope. God bless you.